Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that we just found the world's oldest cheese. <laughs> it was found in an ancient Egyptian tomb, and it was made from cow milk and either sheep or goat milk mixed together, and it was found in a broken clay jar from the 13th century BC um, in Egypt, which is kind of cool. It's a city called Memphis. And chemists at the University of Catania in Italy used mass spectrometry to analyze the antique cheese, which basically looked like a piece of soap that weighed several hundred grams. So we have 3,200-year-old cheese. And we actually figured out that their cheese had bacteria that caused an infection called brucellosis in it. So our cheese making has come a little bit uh, further along. We don't really have that disease in the US anymore, but it affects hundreds of thousands of people and animals worldwide today, and it looks like the flu. It's not that you really need to worry about that, but it's kind of interesting to note that we've been using dairy fat in our diet for a very, very long time, and we're still around. Today's guest is an amazing human being, a dear friend, a former guest on the show, an 11-time New York Times best-selling author, and internationally recognized leader, speaker, and educator in the field of functional medicine. He's the Pritzker Foundation Chair in Functional Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic, and an all-around just amazing, helping human who has done more to change the face of modern Western medicine to make it more functional than anyone else I know. None other than Dr. Mark Hyman. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Dave. Good to be back. The last time I interviewed you was about the doctor's pharmacy, where you were talking about how to use food as medicine. And we talked about why you might want to eat some fat and some meat. And we talked about the dangers of fructose going back a couple years in 2014. Mark, what's changed in medicine since we first talked four years ago? Oh my goodness, so many changes are happening. We are actually in an extraordinary scientific revolution that is finally breaking through to mainstream medicine. And the microbiome is one of the profound wedges in the system that's changing the paradigm where we see how the gut flora affects your immune system, it can cause depression, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, Alzheimer's, autism. And we're learning that the way we think about disease doesn't make sense anymore. And I've been at Cleveland Clinic in the last four years, and it's a traditional medical system. But within that system, people are realizing that the way we think about disease has to change, the way we deliver care has to change. And we're seeing people coming out of the woodwork wanting to work with us. Or talk. I just talked to a uh, cardiologist there who wants to study keto diets versus Mediterranean, look at all the metabolic effects. And we're just seeing an incredible openness to this paradigm shift that's happening, uh, more than I've seen in 30 years of doing this. In addition to all of your writing and your Broken Brain docuseries and your work with some of the leading, I would call them skeptical physicians in the world who are less skeptical because of you know, trying your stuff, uh, you just launched Doctor's Pharmacy, uh, your new podcast, uh, which is which is doing really well. And it's that kind of success that led me to uh, profile you in my new book, Game Changers, where I looked at almost 500 people who had big impacts on the world to say, what are the common elements amongst them? And one of the things that stands out uh, from you, just in that, that data-driven analysis, is you have this really big uh, kind of compassionate uh, giving heart uh, that you don't find in every doctor why are you like that <laughs> you know that is a great question dave i remember being three years old and just wanting to love everybody and hug everybody and i was like noticing that all these grown-ups were just so not into it and were so disconnected from their hearts and it was just so painful for me and i I have that feeling that's never gone away and I still feel like that and I don't actually know where it came from I think I was sort of born with it but I, I do have a sense that uh, the, the world you know there's, a, there's a, a Hebrew phrase it's called tikkun olam which means repairing the world or healing the world and I think it's something that just kind of got in my DNA uh, and also I studied Buddhism back in college and the whole notion of compassion and understanding the way that our ego gets in the way of our actually being in the world 
to create love and connection and change and growing and learning that, uh, you know, it, it sort of shaped what I do and everything I do. Tell me about what you did in Haiti. Uh, well, like everybody else, I saw the news of the earthquake and I just finished reading a book about Paul Farmer who revolutionized care in Haiti in the poorest place on the planet uh, other than, than in, the, in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, he, he um, created an extraordinary impression of me through that book. Uh, and then the earthquake happened in Haiti and a series of events happened that allowed me to put together a team. A patient with a private jet flew us down and we were the first on the ground in the major hospital in Port-au-Prince and delivered to trauma care to the 300,000 people who were injured. There were 300,000 dead. And, and through that process, um, you know, I began to think about how we need to apply a different model of care to chronic disease. Because uh, I was shocked to learn that the major diseases in the hospital weren't malaria or TB or AIDS. They were heart disease and diabetes and hypertension and kidney failure. And I was like, whoa. And I began to realize that these are social diseases and we need a social cure. And that led to me developing a program with a faith-based um, healthy living curriculum in church in Southern California, Saddleback with Rick Warren, where we got 15,000 people to lose a quarter million pounds by doing it together in groups and supporting each other, loving each other. I kind of call it the love diet. There are somewhere around a quarter million people will hear this episode or about to cross 100 million downloads uh, this year. And some of them are, they got it. They've been doing this for a while. They're, they're kicking ass. And there's a big group of people who are saying, maybe I think this is possible, but I'm not there yet. And what I want you to share with people today is after all of this time doing that, that amazing uh, you know, first responder, drop everything, show up where there's a disaster and you know, be, a, be a doctor and watch what's happening. From that perspective and also just from seeing the thousands of patients that go through Ultra Wellness Center, uh, what, what can the people who are almost there, like they're on the path to just having limitless energy and having no pain in their bodies and having brains that work as much as they want them to, what can you share that's just critically important for those people? They've taken a first step, there's another step coming. Well, I, I think you know it's important for everybody to ask themselves what matters to them, what they care about. Um, what they want for themselves, for their life, for their way of being in the world, and connect to that because that leads to a whole series of decisions and behaviors that actually allow you to make choices to enhance your health, to improve your well-being, and be curious about how do you live a more a powerful, integrated life where you inhabit your body, you inhabit your mind, you inhabit your, your emotional life in a way that creates power and energy and vitality and impact and that you're able to show up in your life and love your family and love your your partner and, and be engaged in the work that you do and do all the things that really matter for people instead of walking around like zombies in a brain fog. So I just ask people to check in with themselves and ask them what really matters, connect with that, and then what are the decisions that flow from that? So it, it's sort of the why you do what you do yeah. and, and that actually leads you to make better decisions with food. Yeah. When you were writing Food Pharmacy, you touched on some stuff that, that's really important uh, to me. You mean food, what the heck should I eat? Uh, yeah, sorry, Food Pharmacy. Or, doctors, well, doctors, pharmacy doctors Pharmacy, pharmacy with an F yeah. is, uh, is my podcast. Okay. Clearly, I need some more bulletproof coffee. <laughs> it's late in the afternoon. Good. We just there had we some sushi. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, at a, we're at a conference, actually, the Archangel Conference, recording this live, so there may be some background noise as well. Uh, and we've just spent a few hours hanging out and chatting. Uh, so it was a great time to just sit down and pick your brain some more uh, for listeners. Uh, when you were writing, what the heck should I eat? You talked about not just what food does to people, but what food does to uh, the environment around us. Mm -hmm. And Kimball Musk was on the show, and you know, we talked about his work in that space and, and how there's a revolution in grass-fed agriculture and fresh and local. What are the bigger impacts, other than what you get in your brain, uh, from when someone eats, what are the bigger impacts that you discovered when you're writing your book? Well, you know, the the, the podcast, The Doctor's Pharmacy, came out of um, things that I learned uh, that I knew about, but really got into in writing the book, Food, What the Heck Should I Eat?, which is that food matters to everything that matters. It matters to our health. It matters to the economy. It matters to the environment, to climate, to social justice issues, to poverty, to violence, to kids' ability to learn even national security. And, and 
most people don't connect food to all these things. So how does that work? And I began to unpack that. And I'm writing another book that really goes even deeper into this. I included some in the book, but food um, clearly it causes chronic disease. It's the number one cause of our chronic disease epidemic, which affects one in two people. One in two people have prediabetes or type two diabetes. It also clearly affects the economy. Medicare and Medicaid are the biggest drivers of our federal deficit. And by 2040, 100% of our entire federal tax revenue will be required to pay for Medicaid and Medicare at our current rates. It's bankrupting businesses. You know, Starbucks spends more on healthcare than on coffee. GM spends more on healthcare than on steel. So it's really troubling. And in fact, globally, if there's going to be $47 trillion, which is the GDP of the six largest nations combined, we spend on chronic lifestyle preventable disease in the next 20 years. So economic burden. And then environmental stuff. And I didn't really understand the global impact of this. I did know that one-fifth of our fossil fuels is used for growing food and transporting food for human consumption. I did know that, you know, industrial factory farm animals contribute methane and uh, carbon in the environment. I, I did understand those things, but I didn't really grasp the fact that the food system as a whole is the number one solution for reversing climate change, that we can draw down carbon in the environment to pre-industrial times by dealing with food waste. 40% of our food is wasted, and that goes into landfills and creates methane. We use tilling in the soil, which causes soil erosion. We've depleted tens of feet of topsoil in America. We fit so much, thank God, but we're mining our soil within 50 years. We're not going to have any soil. We're using the, the, the agricultural methods that allow this erosion instead of actually building soil, which can then sequester and hold carbon. Uh, we're not using regenerative agriculture practices. We're not using uh, regenerative and restorative practices for animal husbandry. So we can actually, using regenerative grazing practices, take down carbon as well. And, it, and factory farms are one of the biggest contributors to climate change and methane. So all these things together can have huge impact. And then you look at just the environmental degradation. The runoffs from nitrogen in the waterways is causing dead zones because the nitrogen fertilizes the algae and it suffocates all the fish and the animals in the ocean and the, and, the, and the lakes and rivers, and that goes in the ocean. And you have a dead zone the size of New Jersey and the Gulf of Mexico and all the pesticides. And, and the GMO glyphosate uh, is, is a Roundup made by Monsanto for soybeans. It's sprayed on all their wheat products, even though they're not GMO because it exfoliates them before harvest. And they were just fined $289 million by a court in California because of the fact that they found it caused cancer, that they knew it from their internal records, and that they denied it, and they got punitive damages of $250 million. There's 5,000 similar lawsuits going on now around Monsanto. So environmental degradation, climate change, and then poverty and social justice. You know, most people don't understand that the food that we eat affects our behavior, affects yes. our mood, our cognitive function violence. Uh, we know, for example, from studies that in, in prisons yes. with violent prisoners, if you give them a healthy diet, you reduce violent crime in prisons by 56%. If you add a multivitamin, it reduces it by 80%. They're nutritionally deficient. Dave, I remember I was, uh, I was uh, in my office one day and I got a letter, a handwritten letter from a prisoner in prison who said, I read your book, Ultra Metabolism. This was like 13 years ago. And he said, I realized that my violent behavior was a direct result of the food that I was eating, and I feel like a different person right now when he changes wow. diet. So we see we see violence. We see the cycle of poverty and dysfunction. You look at the developmental effects of a poor diet and processed food and sugar and additives on kids and their brain development. They can't function in school. We know that there's an achievement gap that kids who are in, in school and going to breakfast with soda and Doritos or Flaming Hot Chips, they can't focus, they can't function. And when you change that, it transforms them. I, I remember talking to this guy who started charter school in Washington, D.C., in, in one of the poorest areas uh, of the city with these disadvantaged kids all on welfare eating garbage, and he fed them three meals a day. These kids now are going to Harvard and Yale, and all the white kids in the other neighbors want to send their kids to this school. So it is a profound effect on our kids and behavior. And, and even... National security. We now have 70% of our military recruits. I, I met with General Jack Keane, who was the head of you know, Desert Storm in the, in, the, in the Army Division, the tanks. And he told me, Mark, we have 70% of our military recruits are not fit to be accepted into the military. So we have across the spectrum of our society, everything that matters 
health, the economy, climate, national security, environment, kids, education, poverty, social justice, violence. I mean, we know from uh, records uh, that have been released through FOIA, emails from Coca-Cola and other companies, that they are deliberately targeting the poor. I, I was asked to give um, the uh, speech at the anniversary of Martin Luther King's death in Harlem at the Riverside Church. The Governor Cuomo was there and others, and I, I got the last speech. And I, I shared about how our food system is a system of oppression that keeps poor the poor down and disadvantaged. It's a vicious cycle. So we really have to look at food in a much broader context than our own personal choices, than our own health, which is important, but it it's really matters. And what you put on your fork every day is the single most important thing you do to affect yourself and the world around you. And it's empowering because if, if what I'm saying is true, and it is, it sure is. If it's true, then the implications are we as consumers have choice. You know, I, I had breakfast with the uh, CEO of Nestle's the other day uh, in Canada, who used to be the head of food, uh, president of food in the US for Nestle's. And, you know, it was remarkable how the consumer movements around food are driving their decisions and behavior. For example, they stopped being part of Grocery Manufacturers of America, yes. which is a trade association of all the big food companies. That was a Monsanto front group. It's not. Well, uh, it, no, it's, <laughs> but, it, it, uh, but, you know, we were talking because he said, he said that, you know, we decided to quit that group because they were trying to slow by opposition any positive change. They yes. were trying to oppose GMO labeling. They were trying to oppose uh, soda tax. They were opposing things in ways that were often illegal and they actually got fined for what they were doing like through a, a lawsuit, like I think $17 million. And then a bunch of companies, like Unilever, Campbell's, Nestle's all jumped out of that and created a new alliance to actually move things forward. He told me the things that people don't even know that, that they stopped marketing foods to kids which is phenomenal, but people don't know about it. They, they're starting to do regenerative agriculture. They're looking at nutrigenomics. They're changing the product formulations. They're fighting regulations that prevent them from reformulating their products, like lean cuisine, which has to be low fat, which they don't want to be anymore. So our choices matter, and these companies change their behavior based on what we do, what we buy, and what we say and think. That, that is so... Sorry, that was a long speech. No, it, it, <laughs> but it, it's, all, it's all real. And that was yeah, my short version. <laughs> I've met with presidents from some of the larger companies as well, and they're worried because mm -hmm. what they used to do, they could tell themselves, oh, this is good for people, these you know, sugar water, yeah, no problem. Uh, but the sales are dropping because people uh, are paying attention. They're hearing your work, reading your work, listening to podcasts and things like that and saying, you know, I'm just going to change my behavior for me, but the impact of doing the right thing for you is that if no one will buy the crap, no, no one's going to try and sell it to people who don't know any better. Yeah. And we're seeing a bigger shift in the last three years than I, than I ever imagined yeah. would happen in that period of time. Yeah. And in, in large part, it happens because of spending, but it also happens because you come at this from a an just impeccable, highly credentialed, highly experienced, uh, credible Mine's really, I didn't tell you I got my medical degree online and just like paid, <laughs> paid fifty bucks and I got that. <laughs> um, but I mean, you walk in there and you talk with them, and it's not the nineteen seventies coconut oil is a deadly poison kind of BS that maybe form that caused their product strategy a long time ago. So I feel like now is the time to do it. But the but you know what's yeah. also interesting is the food companies responded to the dietary guidelines. Yes. So they were only doing what the government told them to do, eat low fat, take out this, don't put in that, less salt. And they and they were just responding to try to do the right thing. And there were all these unintended consequences. And I'm not defending the food company because there were some intended consequences. Oh, yeah. And some of their behavior is egregious. Uh, and like, for example, targeting minorities by Coke and so forth. But but the the, the fact that, that these big monsters are changing their behavior based on what we do as individuals is something I want everybody to understand. You vote three times a day with your fork and that matters. And what you eat matters and where you buy your food matters and how you make choices around what you're eating is enormously important. And, and these companies then have the power, you know, like Walmart says, we don't want trans fat anything. All their vendors have to change because they're one of the biggest, the biggest, uh, uh, you know, outlets for their product. Or they say we don't want as much cardboard and packaging. Or 
if these big food companies say to their ag, big ag companies, we don't want you to have GMO or we don't want we don't want you to you know make high fructose corn syrup and everything, and they, they'll start to change what they're doing. If we want regenerative agriculture, if we want organic, and and right now we we need those big companies to help push the marketplace because unless we actually realize that that the way things change is by scale, it's not going to change. In other words, if if the biggest food company in the world says to uh, their agricultural producers, we only want regenerative agriculture. We want you to change your soil practices. We want no-till farming. We don't want you to use these drugs or these. You know, what <laughs> I went to this conference once. It was like an ad conference. I don't know why they invited me to speak. And this guy's head next to was was. Um, I said, "What do you do?" He says, "Well, I'm in plant medicine." I'm like, "Plant medicine?" I'm like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "Yeah, we make pesticides." <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I thought. That and the other guy sitting next to me was Mr. Cargill. <laughs> wow. And I was like, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> Who invited me to this party? The the fact that you're willing to go to those parties and crash them is, is one of the reasons. I was invited. I wasn't even crashed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you're, you can just tell from your energy, like you're one of the, the game changers. Uh, and uh, that's why I included you in the new book. Uh, because I want people to know what's going on inside your mind and the habits and, and things that you do. And so uh, one of the laws, uh, your stories in there, the laws about how people behave, and the book, uh, Game Changers, is on Amazon for pre-sale right now. And so I want to dig a little... Awesome. Oh, oh, thank you. Um, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper into, uh, uh, into what goes through your mind when you're sitting down next to Mr. Cargo and Mr. Pesticide. Uh, I mean, do you get pissed off at these guys? Do you feel you know, sorry for them? Like, like, what's up? Know, it, it goes back to your first question, which is, you know, I lead with love. Okay. And compassion. You always show up that way wherever I've seen you. Okay. And these are human beings. Yeah. You're, everybody's exactly. a human being before they're Republican, conservative, yeah. whether they're, you know, Monsanto exactly. or whether they're, you know, like uh, Whole Foods. They're all human beings. And um, they have their beliefs and their attitudes, and it's fine. We may disagree. But I always lead with building a heart connection with somebody, an authentic relationship, and having a real conversation and inquiring and asking instead of like, you know, grandstanding and yeah. pounding them with my beliefs. I'm like, I'm curious, like, what, what is this for you? What do you think of this? What about these issues? What about this fact? And, and we start to have a dialogue and it's, it's, a, it's a dynamic, engaging, real conversation. Like I, I, don't, I don't have any illusions that, you know, that they are necessarily gonna agree with me or do anything to change what they're doing. But it, it, all, a lot of it for me is being curious about how do they think, right? You know, what did, what, did, uh, what, did, what did Lincoln say? Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Right. I don't exactly see them as my enemies, but I think, you know, there's a, I think it's like, I don't know the number exactly, but I think it's like an $18 trillion global food industry. And uh, it's the biggest, it's the biggest industry on the planet and it's not going away. So we have to figure out how to push it in the right direction. And hating on it isn't how to push it in the right no. direction. No. And my experience with these people is when I first started getting to know, uh, you know, people are running really big billion dollar plus uh, food things, making decisions. And as Bulletproof's growing, I realized so many of the things that I want to do, there are regulations preventing me from yeah, doing it. Right. And and that is not cool. And none of us like it. And even the companies who are doing what I would consider nutritional harm and environmental harm to the world, when you talk to the executives, they do not say, oh yeah, we're doing that ha ha ha, but we're rolling in the bucks. It, there's no mindset like that. They believe they're feeding the world. They believe they're doing the right thing because they have the facts wrong. Right, so it's changing their mindset. But when they change the mindset, hey, most of them have kids and grandkids. They want to create that same kind of a world. So it's just a matter of getting the knowledge that we now have into their hands, letting it soak in, and creating a world where, well, if you don't do that, no one buys your stuff. So you have to do the right thing. And one of the areas that I'm most passionate about is in grass-fed agriculture. Yeah, because did I tell you I'm thinking of? Starting a grass-fed ranch in Colorado. Are you really? Yeah. So I, I have <laughs> I have four sheep uh, and two pigs on my small organic farm, and I can tell you where the sheep poop, the grass is insane, and where the sheep don't poop, the grass is okay. And there are people who say, well, you can't eat animals; it's bad for the environment. Eating industrial animals is unethical. It it tortures the animal. You're going to get toxins from glyphosate. You're going to get all sorts of bad stuff. It's bad for the world. And if you do that, you're supporting. You're voting with your dollar to say. Please destroy more topso. Please overgraze. Please do all the bad things that happen when you have corn and soy fed animals. But if you're eating less meat, which is good for you, but not no meat, and super high quality grass fed local stuff, 
you're now decentralizing agriculture. You're creating healthier soil in more places on the planet. And you're restoring ecosystems yeah. and sequestering carbon. And what I didn't realize is that now we, we drain 1.3 trillion gallons more every year out of the Aglala Aquifer, which is the biggest aquifer in America that basically irrigates the entire agricultural base in the Midwest, then it's being faster than it's being replenished from rainfall. And so we're going to run out of water and soil in 50 years. And when you actually change the form of agriculture from to no-till, which means you don't dig up the soil set of roads, and you use regenerative grazing practices, you actually sequester carbon and you sequester water. So you literally, the reason we're having droughts and floods is because of how we farm. Yes. And putting the water back in the soil and putting the carbon back in the soil creates a sustainable model of food production for the next, you know, thousands of years. We didn't learn from the, from the Dust Bowl, which happened in the 1910s, 1920, somewhere around there. And we destroyed a bunch of our topsoil and we've been continuing to do it, but now we spray poison <laughs> on top of the soil. And you know what happened with the, with the Dust Bowl? They killed a hundred and like what was that? Uh, they killed like sixty million buffalo. Yeah, they got rid of and, the animals that poop on the soil. Yeah, and then the soil, and then they started the agricultural practices, and that's what led to this. And it's it's happening again. But when we make a decision to say I'm going to go to the farmers market and buy a couple pounds of grass fed beef that supported my local soil, less fuel was used to feed it, less fuel was used to transport it. No environmental destruction happened, no bunnies lost their homes because of a big tractor making soybeans for your turf runoff, for for fertilizers for the yeah. for the soybean and the corn, all those things, yeah. The definition of biohacking uh, when I wrote it was uh, changing the environment around you and inside of you so that you have full control of your own biology. And it's easy to think about taking a bite of food and changing the environment inside of you because that's a big thing to do. But when you realize that there's secondary impacts on the environment around you, you choose food that might make you okay, but that lessens the environment around you. Over time, your performance will necessarily decline. So top three things people can do if they want to do something that makes them have more energy now and supports the environment around you. Whoa, top three things. I thought you were saving that for the end. That, that, this is, a, <laughs> this is my, 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 my first of 50 top three things. Okay, so um, in terms of your personal health, uh, environmental health and climate change and economic health and social health there the aspiration is to eat in a way that restores your health restores the environment restores our social fabric and that means eating real food it means eating minimally processed food or not processed food it means being conscious about how your food is grown when you can you can't always be perfect but if you can as much as possible eat food from local organic farms, from no-till farms, if you can eat regeneratively grown animal food, if you can understand the linkages between these things, you're going to restore your health, you're going to restore the healthy environment, the climate, the economy, improve our social fabric, reduce social injustice, just by what you put in your mouth. Mark, earlier uh, I mentioned uh, Game Changers, uh, the, the new book, and boiled down 46 laws of people who perform better. and what I found from looking at the data from asking that question you just mentioned uh, is that there were sort of three big buckets that people who, who did world changing things did. And they wanted to be smarter. They, they wanted their brains to work better. Uh, they wanted to be uh, faster. As they, they wanted their, their, the rest of their biology to work really well and to, to get the things done. And they also wanted to be happier. And the data is really conclusive that the people who are happier and actually work on their happiness perform better. And people I can find the book, uh, you just Google or go to Amazon and search for Bulletproof Game Changers and, and you'll find the book. But of those three things around being smarter, being faster, being happier, what do you do for happiness in your own life? That's a great question. <laughs> and I think uh, it, it may sound esoteric, but the reason that most of us suffer is because of our beliefs and what they lead to in terms of our perceptions of any situation and then what that makes us feel like, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, often our beliefs are determined by experiences and things we've had that we generalize to everything. For example, when I was a kid, I 
had a stepfather who had a rage problem. And uh, one day I was seven or eight years old. My mother said, take, we didn't have garburators back then, you know, or garbage disposal. So she said, take the soup that's left over and throw it down the toilet. And my stepfather was a clean freak. And I threw the soup down the toilet. I flushed the toilet. I walked out of the bathroom. He's like, did you wash your hands? I'm like, no. Because <laughs> I just flushed the soup down the toilet. And I told the truth. And he went into a rage. He picked me up. He threw me across the room against the wall. And it traumatized me so that I learned that it wasn't safe to tell the truth because I would get in trouble. Wow. And unpacking that and understanding that and saying that there was another explanation for that. that the explanation was that he was a rageaholic, that he had an anger problem, that he was a clean freak, that he, in that situation, that's what happened. But that's not necessarily how everyone and everything is going to react. And so once I began to realize that, I'm like, well, I can be more direct. I can be more honest. I can get rid of that belief that was causing me to have relationships that didn't go as well as I'd like because I wasn't able to say what I really felt or thought or needed. So that's just an ex one example. How old were you when you figured that out and unpacked it? When I really did? Yeah. Um, I mean, I knew it, and I, but the behavior was so ingrained. It was really only until the last few years when I worked with someone who helped me unpack my beliefs. It's this woman named Shelly Lefko. She's got this crazy little practice of belief work. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's so powerful. And I think, you know, from a Buddhist perspective, we know that your suffering is directly related to your perception of a situation and what you believe about it, whether it's true or not. And so, I, I, you know, working on that level of your beliefs is a powerful way to get happiness. And the other thing that's really important is this notion of service. So most of us are out there doing things for ourselves, trying to get ahead, trying to make ourselves healthier and ourselves smarter and ourselves faster and ourselves happier. But at the end of the day, the science really shows that when you serve others, when you are altruistic, when you are engaged in helping others, that it creates more happiness, more pleasure, more fulfillment, yes. and that building the social network and the social relationships and the connections, not what can I get from so-and-so, but what can I give to so-and-so? And I know you do that. I do that. We both do that. And it's, yeah. it actually leads to a much happier life. So if you, what's the secret of happiness? It's parking your ego at the door, being of service, and working on your beliefs. That those all showed up consistently among high performers in the data set behind Game Changers. And so those are, are parts of different laws. And the idea is there's 46 different laws uh, that everyone does. So you can prioritize where you want to put your energy first. But you said something that's just super profound. You're 50 something? 58. You're 58. All right. So you went 55 years. I know I'm a slow learner. No, you're not. This is the thing. You have, you've, you've written 11 New York Times bestsellers. You've changed the face of functional medicine. And you're causing great good in the world. And you were still running on programming that happened when you were a child. Yeah. I mean, I, I worked on it for years. Yeah. But until I, and, and I've gotten better at it, but until I really unpack that story, and that's just one example. And I have many, many of those. Oh, we, we all do. And I was able to actually free up and I, I'm like, okay. And I, you know, the less I do for me, the more I do for others, the more I kind of let my, I don't know what the word is, um, not personal needs, but it's, it's ego. you know, like my ego at the door and just show up and just be love and just be kind and just serve things work out and i and if i am doing something it that's it's not usually for me you know like yeah. this book i'm writing about the food system or the podcast i do or the the work i do at cleveland clinic or the work with my patients it's all about what can i do for you yeah and and then it feed it feeds me it comes back a thousand fold if you write a book for yourself no one's gonna want to read it <laughs> that's just how it works uh, and the reason it's so profound that you can talk about that is that everyone listening to the show, uh, and me too, I, I had lots of the stuff I, I had to work through in my own patterns, you learn these lessons before you can think about them, and they just show up in your decisions, in your relationships, in your business, with your friends, uh, in everything you do, and they're entirely invisible. When did you first know? So you really got through this a couple of years ago. When did you first go, wow, this is an issue for me? Were you 20? Were you 30? I probably was in my 30s, maybe, when I first realized it. But, you know, there's different things that have happened. Yeah. You know, there's a few things that have happened that, for me personally, that have really affected my way of being and my belief in myself. And 
they were epiphanies that happened in my life in different circumstances that I didn't really like learn. They just like were lessons that showed up. One was when I was 18, because I, I was kind of a weird kid and I was a little nerdy and I read books and didn't have a lot of friends and, and uh, people made fun of me. And I went out West and I was after high school and I was backpacking and I was camping with these guys and it was, they were kind of making fun of me. And I, you know, I would get very hurt. I was very sensitive. Uh, and then I just had this epiphany that, you know, maybe in what they're saying, there's a nugget for me to learn and reflect on, or it's their own nonsense or bullshit. <laughs> and, and they just have to work through and I have to have compassion for whatever their issue or suffering is. And that was huge. Uh, the second thing was probably about four or five years later, I, I, I remember, you know, being a little anxious about what was happening in my life, what was going to happen, how I was going to figure out or whether was this going to happen. And I just remember having this moment, this epiphany where I, I just realized that if I reframe my way of being to trusting that everything was going to work out, that I would be better off, that I just, I just could literally had this sense of faith that everything that was happening to me was the right thing in that moment, even if it wasn't great, like that there was some part of the path. And I can look back now 50 years and I can go, oh, I get how everything's connected. In retrospect, I understand the linkages between all the events in my life that led to who I am in this moment, which is exactly what I want to be doing and where I want to be. So that was, that was the second thing. Um, and, and, um, the third thing was, was sort of realizing that, and this came a little bit later, cause I think I, I, you know, early on, I was sort of about to prove that I was okay and prove that I could be successful and prove to my dad, you know, and do all the things that we often do. And once I sort of got out of my own way and I go, this isn't for me. Like I'm not here to serve me. I'm here to be a service in the world and to love and just show up. I don't get stressed at all anymore. Yeah, like I just, never, way I never get stressed. And I'm like in the most awful situations and think people are you know, horrible as things are happening. And I'm like, and sometimes I, you know, there's some personal thing, like with a family member, I might get, you know, I might get a big feeling, but most of the time, like, and my wife's like, how, like, <laughs> You know, the plane we miss or this happens, or I'm like, whatever, it's all gonna work out. And and I just don't have connection to anxiety around worry and stress. And Not now, but you did before. I did, yeah, I did. Uh and and uh you know, last year I got really, really, really sick. And I, I think it, it even took me another level deep into it. I was worried about you. Yeah, Dave, you were helping me. I appreciate it. I'm like, Dave, what do I do? I'm dying. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm a skinny guy. I'm like, you know, 6'3", 185 pounds. And I was down to 157 pounds, almost 30 pounds right. lighter. Uh, I, I couldn't work. Uh, I had uh, rip-roaring inflammation throughout my body. And my colon was completely inflamed from top to bottom. Uh, I couldn't really eat. I was nauseous, 24 seven pain. Um, it was unrelenting in my gut and I couldn't think I couldn't focus. I couldn't work. I literally could go from my bed to the bathroom back and forth 20 times a day. And I didn't have my brain. I didn't have any emotional capacity. I didn't have, um, my body. And I'm like, I was actually all okay with it all. And I was peaceful within it because I felt like I had this sense of who I was in a spiritual way that was this sort of ever present, you know, eternal part of myself that, uh, I was resting in and I just was surrendered in that state. And I didn't know if I was going to die. I didn't know if I was going to live. And many people thought I was going to die. And I, I realized that, um, you know, there's no reason to worry about anything. Like I could just be, in the peace of just being in that experience. And it sounds crazy, but I wasn't fighting it and I just surrendered to it. And that surrender is really how I live my life. Like, I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know what's going to show up, but I pay attention and I look at the signs and I watch what comes into my life and who comes into my life. And then I, I go with it. Like, you know, it's like that. I, I talk about it on my podcast with Michael Beckwith, but it sounds like that joke about the guy who's like drowning and you know he's praying to god to save him and this boat comes by and he's like no no, no i'm waiting for god and the submarine comes by and no no i'm waiting the helicopter comes by with the rope he's like no, no no i'm waiting for god and then he dies and drowns and he goes god why did you forsake me he says what do you mean i sent a boat i sent a plane i sent a helicopter a submarine you know and i think it's it's important to be alert to what's actually happening and that those are the lessons for me and i may be different for everybody else that have really helped me surrender 
to drop my ego, to be in love and compassion, to, to be honest and truthful in my relationships and experiences, and to just trust. It's amazing that we can go from talking about food and <laughs> social injustice uh, to what... That was soul food we were talking about. Uh, it, it, it was. Uh, but the ability to speak your truth, even though you got programmed early on to not speak your truth and to walk the path that got you there... Um, by sharing that and just being vulnerable enough to do that as you know a, a smart leader in in different fields, it I'm hoping that that inspires listeners to say, well, if a guy like Mark had to go through that stuff, whatever they have gone through in their own path probably isn't nearly as bad as they think it is, and if they haven't dealt with it and they don't, they will not show up in the world the way they can, and. A big motivation for me in starting Bulletproof uh, was that I wanted to write down all the stuff someone should have told me when I was 20. Yeah. And, and food, like I said, when, when you wrote about Game Changers, you mean? And when I wrote, when I started Bulletproof, the blog, and I started oh, doing the podcast, and Game Changers is uh, the analysis of what 450 people have said matters most, yeah. uh, that's data-driven and quantified and turned into rules and little you know, actions you can take as well as, as little questionnaires and quizzes that tell you whether you should do this uh, first or do something else first, but where do you focus your effort to become a better, higher performing human being? Instead of saying, I'm gonna copy that one guy, because you're not that one guy, but if everyone agrees on something, by the way, everyone agreed on food first. Uh, but yeah, really? the, yeah, of course, because it's such a, a, a thing that, that lynch, it's a linchpin for everything that happens in and around you. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't just that, it, it was that if someone would just have told me in a way I could understand this, maybe I would have looked for my own bad beliefs, the yeah. ones you talked about way earlier in life, instead of just walking around and acting like a jerk. And your story about uh, the guy in prison who changed his life, when I first lost, lost my first 50 of the 100 pounds I've lost, it was in my early 20s, and I asked- Where did you lose? Do you want me to help you find it? Uh, <laughs> no, I can stay wherever it went. Stay, uh, it was in a McDonald's, you dropped it? <laughs> I, I certainly tried it there, that didn't work. Uh, but. I accidentally went gluten free, and I was accidentally. I mean, I didn't know about gluten back then, uh, but I, I was trying to eat more uh, more protein and, and less carbs. So I just cut out grains. And when I lost that fifty pounds, it took about three months. Uh, the other fifty took years to figure out all the other details. But my personality changed because I'd always been, you know, I had really developed muscles on my middle finger, and I was I was an angry. I didn't know I was actually anxious. I was really anxious uh, and and just pissed off all the time. Uh, and I just thought that was kind of my normal state, and just because everyone around me was so stupid, obviously, right? And even my parents were like, "Like, Dave, it was everybody else's fault?" Of course, it was, right? And my parents were like, "Dave, your your personality just changed. We like you better." And I was like, "Wow, like, 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 like yeah. no one had told me this. I didn't yeah. want to walk around being an asshole, yeah. and I probably felt guilty about it." Actually, I was aware. I, of it. I can't say this name of this guy. He's a very famous guy who was known to be a prick and really <laughs> awful personality and yeah. abusive but like a very high level government official. And I changed his diet, he lost 50 pounds. And one of his friends, we were walking to dinner one, with him together, another very prominent guy. I don't know what you did to him, but he's like a whole different person. He's so nice now. <laughs> I'm like, it, you know. It's really funny. Um, I don't know if he'd allow me to say his name on the, I'm not going to, um, but he knows what I'm talking about. A, a very famous band. Um, they invited me to come backstage in Portland with them and they've been drinking Bulletproof coffee on tour and they said, why don't you come on the bus and make some coffee? Like we want to hang out. And I'm like, this is amazing. Like I'm actually hanging out with rock stars. And the band says, Dave, thank you for, for Bulletproof coffee. And it's what, what do you mean? You, you like it? And they said, Oh, we like it. But the reason we like it the most is that our lead singer is so much nicer to tour with. Like, like he's, he's a nicer human being because on tour musicians get, they, they just get beaten up by, constant travel and bad food so by doing this he actually was nice to his band members in a very so different great. way but our personalities will change from food and when you do that those feelings of compassion that you talked about those feelings of service it's, it's much true. easier to have it's them true. when you're not I mean, that, that, right exactly right i mean that's an important point is in order to achieve a higher level of being that makes you happy you have to clear out all the garbage you have to eat right you have to exercise you have to sleep you have to meditate or do some form of restorative practice you have to do all those things foundationally, and then your body can actually respond. I always say it's very hard to be enlightened if you're mercury poisoned or you're, you know, pre-diabetic or your thyroid's not working or you're, you know, have gut flora that's messed up, right? It's, it's much harder to be awake. And, and at the end of the day, that's what we all want. Happiness, be awake, and be fully 
inhabiting our lives in a way that's powerful and engaged and is game changing. <laughs> wow, nice plug there. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Evan. <laughs> in, instead of asking you the top three questions uh, that you've uh, you've answered before, one final question, and, and you can make the answer short. What is the world of medicine going to look like 20 years from now? Just paint me a very brief picture of it. Well, what I think is actually happening is a, a massive paradigm shift. There are a couple of forces happening. One is payment systems are changing. So that means that doctors and healthcare systems will get paid for getting people healthy, not treating people when they're sick. It's called value-based care. And the second is that scientific paradigm is changing. So we have the economic paradigm and the scientific paradigm. And the scientific paradigm is changing because we're understanding the body in a revolutionary new way with the advent of systems biology, with the advent of artificial intelligence and big data. And it's forcing us to rethink disease based on what the root causes are, how the environment interacts with our genes to create who we are, which is all of your work. It's understanding things like mitochondria and gut flora and inflammation and toxicity and nutrition, things that are really absent from medical practice right now will be the standard of care. Within 20 years. I hope. I'm trying to make it faster. It might be longer, but it's inevitable. It's happening and it's being disrupted in many ways outside of healthcare. I just found out from uh, somebody who sold their company to PayPal for $600 million. That was a, a, a digital wallet that paid out all kinds of people for different things and they had different clients. One of them was Google. They have 300,000 people they're paying for doing medical research every month. Wow. Like, what is Google doing? It's not a healthcare system. How is it doing medical research? What is it doing? Why are they paying, you know, 300,000 people to be part of medical research every month? That's the kind of stuff that's happening and it's disruptive and it's exciting and it gives us the potential to leapfrog ahead of what we're doing. It's like going from the abacus to the iPhone. And, and I think we're going to be seeing that happen more rapidly than we think. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you uh, for your work. Thank you for your podcast, uh, The Doctor's Pharmacy. See, I got the name right. You did. F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, a place for conversations that matter. You can find it on iTunes and anywhere you find your podcast. It, it's, if you like Bulletproof Radio, you'll love Mark's show. I, I've been a guest. And if this was an interesting interview for you, check out Game Changers. Just go to Amazon. You can pre-order it. Just search for Bulletproof Game Changers. And you will find an awesome book and hear more from Mark in there. Mark, thanks again. I, I got the book. It's really, I got a free copy. It's awesome, really. If you want to know how great people do great things and are happy, check it out.